One of our great passions at Skybound Capital is fundraising for causes that we and our extended staff believe in, not only in South Africa, but uh, across our offices around the globe. But in recent weeks, uh, there's been a clear focus on Cape Town and the fires that uh, ravaged parts of the Table Mountain Reserve. And through Donate Nation, one of the initiatives here, we started a fundraising initiative for uh, VWS, Volunteer Wildfire Services. And we're joined by uh, Steve Akester and Susan Magna, who are both volunteers. Uh, they represent VWS and they do such an incredible job, this organization, uh, in keeping the residents of Cape Town and Surround safe uh, when the tragedies like this happen. So Steve, first of all, if you could just perhaps give us a, a review uh, of the last week or so in, in Cape Town, uh, how the fire started, how it spread, and the effect that it had on so many lives. Oh, thank you, Matt. Look, the, the circumstances around the actual starting of the fire and that is still under investigation. So I can't really comment on exactly what caused the fire. They, they are still investigating that. But what actually happened was the, the fire seemed to start um, just below UCT and below um, Rhodes Memorial. Um, and the wind was very favorable for the fire to actually start to spread. Um, you know, it was a northwesterly wind and it blew fire quite terrifyingly up towards UCT. Um, firefighters were, were very fast to get on the scene, but you know, um, it, it's very difficult to actually prevent um, fire when it, in, in those sort of circumstances with the wind, um, blowing up and spotting fires all over the place. And, and that's actually what happened. Um, the fire then spread up, um, teams were being called in from, from BWS and from the other um, organizations, WAF, NCC. So there's quite a few organizations that, that um, start reacting to this. And um, the fire went up Devil's Peak. Um, we got involved from, um, from Sunday. Susan was actually on, on duty at the time. They got immediately um, in, um, actioned during Sunday. Um, and you know, so there were teams on the fires immediately. And, and the fire crept up over the mountain. Um, the wind started changing direction. And through the night, when I joined, which was then the Monday night, uh, the Sunday night, um, late into Monday, uh, into Monday morning, you know, it, it had come down and it was, a, a, it was it's quite an aggressive fire that seemed to attack Fred Hook area, um, Deer Park, that kind of area. Um, and it was fast and furious. It was a really um, difficult fire to manage. There were a lot of teams on, on call. Um, the public outcry was incredible. Um, they, uh, you know, people just obviously were aware of what was going on, were aware of what the firefighters were all committed to. And um, the outcry was tremendous, um, from donations to, to people arriving at our base. And I mean, there were, we, were, we had traffic management at the base to try and control the amount of outflowing from, from the public. So it was incredible. As Steve says, Susan, you were on duty at the time. I guess an obvious question is being a volunteer organization in many respects, how quick is it to mobilize uh, the necessary resources in a crisis situation like this? I must say um, the VWS crews are incredible. We all have full-time jobs. So we literally just do this in our, in our I don't want to say spare time, but in our part-time. Um, but I, I happen to be there at base. I happen to be actually training new recruits because obviously every single year we're looking for new people to join because people do uh, fall out for various reasons. Um, they have children or whatever, they go overseas. Or So I happened to be there training new VWS firefighters and there was this small little plume of smoke started at nine o'clock. By half past nine, we got the call out. By quarter to 10, I promised you, there was people arriving at base, jumping in the landies and, and getting to that fire line within half an hour. It's amazing how quickly the members will drop everything, whether they're hiking, whether they're with families, they drop everything and they can be at base within 10 minutes. It's amazing. And they display extraordinary courage in those circumstances, essentially taking themselves 
towards danger that others are trying to avoid. <laughs> yeah, we, we're constantly trying to keep people away from the fires because obviously it's, it's fascinating to people, but we need people to stay away so that we can get on into our jobs. But it is, it's, it's, um, it is, it, they never put us in extreme danger, but the heat and the flames and the, it is very extreme, the conditions, yeah. Steve, I want to ask you a couple of logistical questions uh, that have been raised, uh, perhaps without going into specifics, but there have been comments that we've seen around, A, the management of, of forestry uh, and, and the distribution of, of debris, if I can call it that, in the forest, and that being a, a possible problem uh, in the spread of fires. And then also the management of buildings. We've heard stories of, you know, live embers flying through the air in the wind and actually setting fire to buildings whose gutters haven't been properly managed, etc. How important is it for people uh, to, to realize the fire hazards that might exist in, in their own homes in this regard? I think it's um, up to the public. Uh, everybody is responsible. Um, you know, we see people hiking, leaving litter behind. Um, you know, it's up to everybody to be responsible. Um, we, we, you know, as far as clearing debris, um, that's a responsibility of teams of people that are employed to do it. Um, the, for, the, the management of the whole area is a big, big job. Um, and, you know, this is where we call on people to come and assist and help. Um, everybody is responsible for their area. So the, the um, you know, UCT, et cetera, has their own staff on board that manage their, their building. But this fire was was I think it was, um, you know, as I say, this is going to still be investigated. But this fire was was particularly difficult because this conditions were so right. You know, we always talking about global warming. Well, the conditions were, were perfect. There was very low humidity. There was a very, very high wind. It was dry. It was hot. Um, there was fuel. And that just comes from, from the, the time of the season. It's the end of, uh, you know, end of our su summer, which is dry. And um, if I can slip in as well, because we because we don't um, we we're wildland firefighters, we're volunteers, so we don't have much to do with sort of buildings and whatnot at UCT. Um, but we a, lot, a big part of our job is education for people living on the wildland interface. So people living at the back there in Frederhook. We do try and educate them on, you know, big trees in their gardens and fire breaks and things like that. Susan, you did mention uh, in your first answer just uh, the, the speed of response. But on a positive note, what did this experience of the most recent fire tell you about the sense of community uh, that came together in this instance? Oh, it's amazing. I actually put on my Facebook, I shared a post. Um, you know, there's just nothing like coming back from a fire. So you're shattered, you're exhausted, you've been out there for about 11 hours, you're dirty, you're smoking, you, you can barely see out of your eyes, you, you're just so tired and you get back to base and the piles of water and the piles of energy and the food and the eye drops in the, it makes you quite emotional actually how quickly Never mind the firefighters, but how quickly the people in Cape Town mobilize and come together with such a sense of community. It's, it's really emotional for us. So people chose to get involved. Uh, we were hearing via all the local radio stations. We heard from Gift of the Givers, for example, that you can actually stop now <laughs> donating. We have enough, <laughs> which is yeah. absolutely tremendous. But this has to be an ongoing thing. And what we would like to do is, is bring some focus to how people can get involved on an ongoing basis. And I thought one of the places we could start, we saw a fascinating graphic on what it costs uh, to kit out a, a firefighter uh, and, and equip that individual to uh, as safely as possible go and, and, and take on the flames and the smoke and so on. Steve, perhaps you could give us a, a sense of that in terms of fundraising, uh, what, what it costs to, to kit out a volunteer. Yes, this cost is quite significant. The, the, the PPE or our protective equipment, which is pants, boots, shirts, all of that is provided by VWS. Um, it's literally given to us um, uh, almost, on, almost on loan, I can say. 
because VWS Finance is, and provides all the equipment. But it's everything from vehicles, four-wheel drives. Um, we've got these Land Rovers that have got to get us up, up there. Um, we've got equipment that we use on the fire all the time. It's Raycos, Beaters, that kind of thing, which is, you know, under the harsh conditions, these things break. So it's maintaining all of that. And then we have a, a rotation of, of volunteers every year. We have new ones come in and some leave and that sort of thing. So the PPE has to be replaced. So the cost, I think, is 4,000, 5,000 Rand per firefighter just to get started, you know, mm. um, plus then all the other equipment that needs to be purchased. And we don't have um, unlimited number of vehicles. We, we really are using 30, 40 year old Land Rovers that, that are rebuilt all the time. And we've just actually completed a rebuild this year of two of them. Um, we've got three others that are desperately in need of new engines, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot goes into it and it's all done through donations and it's all done through people's donations, which is the primary source of our income. So let's ask you quickly, how do people donate? Where do they go? <laughs> so to start with, of our website, vws.org.za, there are backer buddy projects as well. Um, one day only did a project where they were selling uh, donations effectively. Um, so there are quite a few organizations, but vws.org.za is the, is the starting point. And that's also where you can sign up as a volunteer. We, we closed this year, but remember, we need volunteers every year. You know, We're constantly looking for new recruits. With COVID, we, we obviously missed the intake for, the, for last year. So this year, we're quite busy. So we've actually closed it off. And obviously, with COVID restrictions, we can't have too many people. So, um, but volunteers must, must, must remember that this is a long-term um, involvement. Um, it's all exciting now because there's been a big fire, but um, you know, there's a lot of maintenance work that we do. There's a lot of other work that we do. And it's very, very important, as you mentioned, clearing, we're doing that constantly and we need hands for that. You know? So you can come on board as a volunteer as well as a donor. donor. And Susan, you mentioned that you were involved in training uh, at the time that the first calls came through. So could you just let any people who are listening to this know um, how they get involved? We've heard Steve mentioned the website, but uh, what kind of individual are you looking for? And, and also, if you could give us a sense of, of the time it takes to, to train as a volunteer. Um, yeah, so everybody thinks that you have to be uh, super fit and be out there fighting the flames, but there are other roles as well. You can get involved in fundraising, you can get involved in planning, which obviously is essential. They're in uh, at base telling us where to go and what to do and keeping us up to date with the status of the fire. You can be a driver and you can drive the crews into the fire and back out. It's just as exciting, but you don't have to undergo all the strenuous uh, fitness tests that we do. The testing itself, is everyone still there? Yes. Oh, sorry, my, everything disappeared for a minute. Um, the training itself, you know, we don't, we don't demand um, a lot. It really, in my mind, it doesn't take a lot of time and effort. There's evening training, there's, there's weekend training on a Saturday or a Sunday. It essentially boils down to one or two days a month. You do hikes, you do scenario training, they train you on the radios, on how to use a Rayco, on that sort of thing. And then when season comes, you get put onto a shift basically once a month. It's really not a lot of your time. And then, of course, when there's fires, then you get called out. Then you can go every second day if you want to. Or if you're busy at work or your wife's just had a baby or whatnot, you don't need to go out at all. So you can really put as much time in it and effort as you as you have. Well, all we can do in closing is to thank you both and, and for your broader teams, for, for the directors of, of VWS, to all the amazing volunteers. I think a situation like this in Cape Town makes you appreciate organizations like this so tangibly. And it encourages people to, to get involved, whether it be through the act of donating or through volunteering their time and their, and their resources. But what is absolutely clear is how necessary it is. So just to reiterate again, that the website www.vws.org.za. You can also 
Access Donate Nation. There's a link on Skybound Capital's website at www.skyboundcapital.com. And you can join in Skybound Capital's initiative via Donate Nation uh, to support the amazing volunteers at VWS. Steve, Susan, thank you for your time. And please spread uh, our thanks from all the citizens of, of the city for the amazing work that the organization does. Absolutely. Thanks, Matt. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. We really appreciate it.